Okay, so um, the next talk is uh, by uh, Thibaut Bonema from, uh, from King's College London, and he's going to speak about generalized hydrodynamics of the KDV soliton gas. All right. Thanks, Peter. And I also would like to thank uh, Herbert for the kind words this morning. So what I will be talking about is that well, we had already a few talks about uh, generalized hydrodynamics. We had a, a few talks about solution gases. And what I will try to, to argue is that we can build a bridge between those two theories, right? And I, I will do it uh, via the special example of KDV. So this will be a fairly, fairly formal talk. So we will, we'll, excuse me. Uh, all right, so I'm interested in, uh, in KDV as a prototypical example of an integrable system, right? And uh, the two aspects of integrability I'm mostly interested in is uh, the fact that there exists an infinite set of conservation laws Right. So for the notation here, I called Q the time conserved charges and J the space conserved currents. Uh, and the other thing I'm interested in is the fact that it's solvable via uh, inverse scattering transform. And in, in particular, uh, the end soliton solution I will focus on uh, can be derived via this IST. So I, I won't go into the details of how it, you get it, but I directly use the results. So what uh, do I mean by multi-soliton solution? Is a solution that uh, asymptotically decomposes into a train of well-separated solitons like that. So each soliton for KDV are uh, indexed by two parameters. Uh, the first one, eta here is a spectral parameter. It controls the amplitude and the velocity of soliton and for kdv um, all soliton have positive velocity here yeah, as you can see and um, no two soliton can have the same velocity so that means that uh, at minus infinity they are ordered from fastest to slowest and at t equals plus infinity they are ordered from slowest to fastest and the other parameter here is called the impact parameter so it's it serves in a way as uh, the initial position of the soliton, okay? So you have two parameters here, one eta, which is a constant it's in time, and as a position of the soliton, which uh, evolves uh, linearly with time. So those two can serve as action angle coordinates, as was argued by uh, Benjamin this morning. Okay, so a few last things is that, uh, as you can see here, I've written plus minus on my impact parameter. That because uh, every time two uh, solitons collide, they incur a phase shift. So since at uh, minus infinity, they are from fastest to slowest, uh, plus infinity from slowest to fastest, it means that in between, they all interact with us, every other. So that's the difference between the x plus and x minus is just given by the sum of the phase shifts. So again, here we have an integrable system, so factoring is um, scattering is factorized. And here you can see that uh, the phase shift can be positive or negative. For, so faster solitons are shifted forward and slower solitons are shifted backward. Okay, so that's the basic object uh, I'm interested in, right? And what I want to do, uh, especially, is look at the limit where the number of solutions become very, very large, right? And uh, what happens also if I introduce randomness in the spectral and uh, impact parameters? So the idea is similar to what uh, Ken and Tamara were talking about, but I, I want to, to take the operation uh, uh, soliton gas literally and uh, look at this uh, from the angle of uh, statistical mechanics okay so here is my partition function for the end soliton solution uh, i've written it in uh, in the action angle coordinates because there's a canonical map to those coordinates that's measure preserving and it's easier that way to identify each solitons so here the momentum is just a certain velocity, so it's eta square. Here, this term serves as a 
generalized Gibbs weight. So uh, a way to look at that is uh, to, to remind yourself that KDV has an infinite number of conserved quantities. So we are not just conserving uh, energy, we're also conserving the particle of momentum. So what you are doing here, for example, is adding uh, inverse temperature for all those additional conserved quantities. So here H is just uh, the value of the conserved quantity for a single soliton of parameter eta. And for KDV, H takes a very simple uh, expression like that. And this here is some sort of constraint uh, which uh, will amount to an entropy term. It's, um, here the constraint is that uh, our soliton gas at time equals zero is supported in a finite interval over length of L. So the main thing to do to, to, to make sense of this partition function here is first to express this constraint in terms of the asymptotic coordinates. And so I will start by flashing the result here and then I will give you uh, some heuristic argument as to why we, we do this. So the idea is that this constraint that the gas is at time equal zero supported on, on this interval just amount to imposing bounds on uh, the integration over the impact parameters here. And the asymptotic interval Li here can be related to L and to eta via the phase shift through a better than that inspired approach. Okay, so here's a sketch of the argument. So here, what is impact parameter? Impact parameter uh, it's this here. So it's uh, it's the norming constant, if you will. Uh, okay, so here's a sketch of the argument. So here I've drawn the ballistic trajectories. And uh, so if the solitons were free, they would just follow those trajectories. But as I said earlier, they can be shifted forward or backward. So if I had a free soliton that would arrive at X left, in fact, it, shift, it shifted and its actual trajectory lies in between those two trajectories so that it arrives at X zero and same thing for this one. So more precisely, um, if I assume that, as I said, all of my solitons at equal zero are between zero L, and if I then assume that uh, soliton I is the leftmost soliton, then because at uh, minus infinity is ordered from fastest to slowest, it means that in between minus infinity and zero, uh, soliton I has almost surely incurred only collisions from the left from faster solutions. It has not yet caught up to slower solutions, otherwise it wouldn't be the leftmost. Okay, so I can write that its position at equal zero is its asymptotic position plus shifts from faster solutions. So that shifts it backward. I can apply the same kind of reasoning for uh, by assuming that instead of uh, I being the leftmost, it's right the rightmost. And then I write that its uh, position at time equal zero is a, its asymptotic position plus shifts from this time slower solitons. So, okay. And then if I subtract those two uh, equation, I uh, recover the expression I wrote earlier for the asymptotic interval, right? It's x right minus x right. And it's directly given in terms of L and the phase shift here from all solutions, because here you have solutions that are faster, you have solutions that are slower. So I've all the set of all solutions here. Okay. And you can see that uh, the asymptotic space is actually shorter than the real space. So the the, the interaction makes the, the solitons go away from each other. And so they can, uh, if they are uh, located uh, in a asymptotic space, uh, space Li at time equal zero, they will be located in a bigger space. Okay. So ultimately, I can rewrite my constraint in this way. But as I was saying earlier, I'm interested in the limit where 
L becomes very large. And to look at this, I will introduce Ln, which a function that interpolates between all the Li uh, in, in such a way. And then I will take the limit N and L go to infinity while keeping the density of solutions, the special density of solutions cons constant. So this equation becomes this one where I've introduced here the spectral density of states, like uh, the same that was discussed before, and K here, which is a asymptotic space density, right? Because it's a ratio between the asymptotic space with the physical space. Okay, so the spectral density of states here, I've introduced it as an empirical measure of the solitons times the density of solid, uh, the, uh, the empirical density over the spectral uh, parameter times the density of solitons. So it's a density of solitons per unit spectral uh, interval and a spatial interval. Okay, so that I can rewrite the average of the conserved densities in this, in this way. And also K here, it defines, if I assume that uh, my gas is homogeneous, it defines a change of metric due to the interaction. So the in interaction extend or dilute uh, the space uh, by report, uh, the, that the solution can perceive in a way. Okay. So one very important uh, part is that equation uh, takes the as the exact same structure of as uh, the nonlinear dispersion relation we just saw before. If we do this uh, identifications here, right? Uh, and so th this equation was rigorously de derived as Alex uh, argued. So that's why we feel justified in in doing in taking this approach to express our constraint, right? Uh, last thing is here you can see uh, a function sigma here, which is called the spectral scaling function. Uh, and this is essentially the, the, the this is probably the most important um, function we we will use in the theory of uh, soliton gas as we will see later. Okay, so now going back to my partition function. So on uh, Monday, Eric talked uh, about uh, large deviation theory. And this theory tells us that in the thermodynamic limit I was discussing earlier, my partition function can be expressed in this way, where uh, the F, MF here is a mean field free energy functional of which user, so the spectral density of states of the uh, soliton gas is a minimizer. So this uh, is in a way is, is some sort of roughly uh, uh, saddle point approximation of my uh, partition function. And here, uh, FMF takes this form. So it's uh, uh, the mean field approximation comes from the fact that uh, the integral is of the density of states here. And you can maybe recognize here the Gibbs weights. Here, this is a Jacobian term that comes from the fact that uh, I was integrating over the velocity, the certain momenta, which is proportional to eta square. This is the constraint, and this is a configuration entropy that comes from a set of theorem regarding the large deviations of the empirical uh, measure, right? Okay, and minimizing this entropy yields what is sometimes called the Yang-Yang equation here, which, uh, which I wrote here in terms of sigma instead of u for, for compactness sake. And this equation relates uh, sigma and by extension u via the nonlinear dispersion relation to the Gibbs weight w. And this characterizes uh, my thermodynamic equilibrium. So it's, this is a, a minimal free energy state. Okay. Uh, no, okay. Here I, here I assume that uh, there was a, a unique minimum. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, okay, and then uh, 
then now that I've minimized my free energy mean field functional, I can define the free energy as the evaluation of this functional at the minimizer and get a very simple expression for the free energy in terms of sigma. And just as uh, we typically do in uh, statistical mechanics, I can also define an entropy, which also takes a very simple expression in terms of sigma. And you can see that this uh, minimal free energy uh, state is also the maximal entropy state. So this is given a Gibbs measure, uh, Gibbs weight, uh, the most probable in a sense. Okay. All right. So in GHD, typically the Yang Yang equation takes this form. This is a form that we, we saw in uh, Olaja and um, Taketo's talk, for example, uh, where epsilon here is a pseudo energy and F is a free energy density. So this is called pseudo energy because if you're considering a non-interacting system, so th this term vanishes. And uh, if you are considering a non-integrable system, well, this Gibbs weight uh, is just replaced by beta E. So this pseudo energy is a generalization of this concept of statistical mechanics to an integrable interacting system, okay? And then, uh, just as in statistical mechanics again, you can also uh, define an occupation function and you we recover Maxwell-Boltzmann statistics, except we replaced uh, the energy with the pseudo energy. Yeah. And this name occupation function is justified in a way because you can see that this is uh, closely related to sigma which, uh, as I got before, is related also to the density of states and uh, density of uh, asymptotic space. So this uh, uh, occupation function is essentially the density of solitons within the asymptotic space. So in a sense, it's the density of solitons before interaction, if you will, okay? Right, so maybe some more familiar relations. So, uh, Again, uh, relying on statistical mechanics, we can uh, uh, recover the average of conserved densities by differentiating the free energy with respect to the inverse temperature. We can recover the density of states with differentiating the free energy with respect to uh, the Gibbs weight. So those two uh, quantities were all already accessible from the Soliton gas theory, but now we also can access, uh, we also have access to the correlations. So at this point, this is fairly formal, but uh, we can show that uh, this uh, expression, uh, this yields this expression here, where HDAR here is a dressed quantity defined in this way. Uh, and here, if you replaced H, for example, by eta or by uh, four eta cube, this just gives you the first two nonlinear dispersion relations Alex talked about uh, earlier. Okay, so this again, yeah, is fairly formal, but it has some uh, real uh, implications because uh, computing the uh, correlation functions uh, by doing ensemble average over many realization of a solution gas can literally take days, whereas this is a simple uh, Friedel equation, an integral equation of, uh, of the second kind, which is very easy to solve uh, numerically. So solving this takes just a few seconds on a mid-range laptop. So we, with this, we have an easy access to these correlations, whereas before we would need a lot of computational power. So you can see this as a useful numerical tool as well. And another thing that's present in these uh, correlations is here, uh, this theta factor that encodes the statistics of the, of the solitons. So I told you earlier that solitons were classical particle because they follow Maxwell-Boltzmann uh, statistics, but maybe, uh, Maybe we missed something or maybe we were wrong, so we decided to check. So here we did some simulations for two types of condensate of solitone gas. The first one is a diluted condensate, which 
uh, about which uh, Giacomo will tell you a, a little bit more in, uh, during his talk. And this is just a uniform spectral uh, density of states. And we've compared the GHG predictions for three, uh, three types of statistics, Maxwell Boltzmann, Fermi Dirac, and Bose Einstein to, uh, to ensemble average over many realizations of solids and gases. And we can see that Maxwell Boltzmann uh, agree very well with our simulation results. Okay, so very quickly, this was thermo the thermodynamics. And uh, let me tell you a bit about hydrodynamics. So we, we start with this uh, infinite number of conservation law, and then we, uh, instead of taking a, a homogeneous gas, we slowly modulate. And uh, as uh, Benjamin uh, uh, argued earlier, we, we perform the hydrodynamic approximation by uh, assuming the separation of scales. We look at a fluid cell that is uh, small compared to the variation of the migration and uh, big enough so that we can assume that it's locally at some equilibrium so that the average at xt can be taken as the average of an observable but within the um, the Gibbs ensemble the local Gibbs ensemble okay and doing a, an average of a fluid cell we recover this mesoscopic continuity equation uh, earlier, I told you that we could write the average of the densities in this way, except this time this, uh, the density of states depend on xt. But it's also uh, uh, fairly natural to assume that we can write uh, the currents in this way with an effective velocity so that we have this kind of expression. And the question is, is this true and how to compute the effective velocity? So Herbert uh, gave a, a, a way to do this earlier uh, this morning using the, the dressing operation. Here, here is another one using the, the change of metric I, dis, I mentioned earlier. So asymptotically, so the particles are well separated, they are free, so they don't interact. And the density on, uh, simply follows Leuvel equation. But then if you apply the change of metric I discussed uh, earlier, you get this equation here for sigma with an effective velocity. Uh, that's uh, very natural as uh, uh, was argued earlier, which is simply just the uh, group velocity plus uh, modifications due to the, all the phase shifts that uh, the soliton incurs while it moves within the gas. So this is essentially a solid angle. And this equation is compatible with the one I showed you earlier, except that uh, you can see that sigma diagonalizes the dynamics. So it works as some sort of continuum of Riemann of in, in, invariance, okay? And these two equations here are exactly the kinetic equations uh, for solid and gas that were derived by Gennady and discussed uh, in the previous two talks. So we can see there are a lot of parallels between those two theories. Okay, so just to recap, uh, we can start with some Gibbs wave, for example, uh, of this uh, of this type. Uh, from the, the true Yang Yang equation, we get sigmas that completely characterizes uh, our thermodynamic equilibrium, uh, our gas at thermodynamic equilibrium. From that, using the Nonlinear dispersion relation, we can get the density of states. Using the second nonlinear dispersion relation or the change of metric, we can get the effective velocity. Uh, from sigma, we get also directly the entropy. We can get the free energy that we then differentiate to get the average or differentiate two times to get the correlations. So, yeah, the idea is that from uh, solid and gas theory, we get some very robust, rigorous uh, uh, derivations and exact solution. And from uh, GHD, we're able to, to probe statistical, uh, to, to get statistical uh, uh, quantities, to, uh, to have very powerful numerical tools, and also to, to go uh, 
beyond integrability proof, integrability breaking, and uh, things like that. All right. Thank you. Okay, questions. Thanks. Uh, sorry, I think I missed where the Gibbs weights appeared in the measure because it looked like you were setting beta equals one somehow in the free energy. Um... Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah, it's here. I see. Yeah. So, so you did set BT equals one for the free energy minimization, or uh, there just was no temperature in Maxwell Boltzmann. Uh, okay. So let me go back. Uh, so in in Maxwell Boltzmann, you have um, ah, okay, the yeah, pseudo energy, so, yeah. and so the pseudo energy includes uh, the Gibbs weight, like thanks, that. Thanks. Thanks. Right. <laughs> Other questions? <laughs> it's just your best way. <laughs> uh, Thibaut, uh, yeah. can you get the three three uh, points correlation? Uh, if you differentiate, uh, yeah, if you if derive you again, you, you can, uh, uh... so you can do, I mean, you can do any. Uh... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Okay, well, um, let's thank Thibault again for his presentation. And we have a coffee break now and we're back in this room at, at four o'clock. Uh, 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 uh,